اعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فوض امري الى الله ان الله بصير بالعباد ولا حول ولا قوه الا بالله العلي العظيم حسبنا الله ونعم الوكيل ونعم المولى ونعم النصير والصلاة والسلام والتحية والإكرام على الرسول المسدد المصطفى الأمجد المحمود الأحمد الذي سمي في السماء بأحمد وفي الأرض بأبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى أهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين المنتجبين الذين أذهب الله أنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا وقل رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اما بعد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتاب الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله واتقوا الرسول واولي الامر منكم صدق الله العلي العظيم my respected elders brothers and sisters in iman across the globe salam alaykum jamia wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh question what was the leadership philosophy of imam ali alayhi salam keep that question in the back of your mind inshallah we'll return to it we've been discussing the concept of islamic ethics of islamic philosophy of islamic spirituality and we said in the first portion of our lecture series that there are certain traits that one can adopt and should adopt with respect to islamic philosophy what does islam truly say what is the ethical traits that i should adopt in my life and ultimately how can i get towards spirituality and we said in the second phase of our lecture series that if one wants to see perhaps the best example of islamic philosophy the best example of islamic ethics the best example of islamic spirituality after rasulullah it is none other than the personality of imam ali ibn abi talib sallallahu alaihi wasallam and we said that islam in the aftermath of the death of rasulullah after rasulullah the world was faced with two islams the islam of those who claim to use the mantle of power and leadership the one who took on the positions after rasulullah and there there of the example of ali ibn abi talib the example of ali is the closest to that of rasulullah the example of ali is the one that is in the closest proximity to rasulullah in every sense of the word whereas there was another example that was not in substance rasulullah's islam was not in substance the islam of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it was only the islam of rasulullah and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in terms of its titles and we said that the rulers in the past they used the titles of khalifa rasulullah they used the title of khalifa allah fi ardh they used the titles of amir al mu'minin but they had no none of the attributes of amir al mu'minin they had none of the attributes of the leadership of rasulullah they had none of the attributes of the leadership that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted his governors and his vicegerents on earth to have and therefore we were left to look at why is it that we follow ali ibn abi talib why do we follow imam amir al mu'minin why is he so pivotal why is he so important why is he such an a nucleus of the belief system after rasulullah and why do the followers of ahlul bayt ali musallam hold ali ibn abi talib in such high esteem and we said this is because he is that individual who embodies all of the philosophy of islam all of the ethics of islam and all of the spirituality of islam and in through his leadership we see that in a very clear example therefore i want to understand in our conversation today and look at a few important dimensions of the leadership of imam amir al mu'minin and how we can derive benefits from it so that we can have a clear system of guidance a clear system of leadership for our modern world our modern world which needs it so much our modern world which is starving for leadership that is ethical leadership that is just leadership that looks after the interests of the common individual the one who doesn't have some connections the one who doesn't have wealth the one who doesn't have family prestige the one who has no means in this world ali ibn abi talib and the leadership that ali ibn abi talib espoused gives rights to those people gives rights to those individuals that you and i in our modern world we see that there's a different face therefore i want to look at what is the model of leadership in our modern world today and how can we learn from the example of ali ibn abi talib what was happening before ali ibn abi talib and how did those people come to power and what was their viewpoint and what what would became clear at the death of rasulullah the martyrdom of rasulullah the next level i want to see is what happened at ali ibn abi talib sallallahu alaihi wasallam's inaugural speech when a leader takes on their position of leadership in a government 
they give an inaugural speech. Ali ibn Abi Talib gave an inaugural speech. What did he highlight in his inaugural speech? And finally, I want to look at what was the example of Ali ibn Abi Talib with respect to how did he show through his actions, his philosophy of what he thought, and his spirituality and how his worldview was completely different than the worldview of some other people who came to lead after Rasulullah and before Ali ibn Abi Talib and after Ali ibn Abi Talib. These are the main things that I would like to highlight in our conversation so that we can understand what was the worldview of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib and what was the worldview of some of the people who are in opposition to Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib so we can understand what is the true face of Islam. And what is the Islam that became popular and is popular, unfortunately, according to some till this day, and how these two views of Islam completely differed. This is our agenda and our schedule for the brief moments that we have together, inshallah. The first point, our world is seeking leadership, is seeking leadership which is just, which is fair, which is equitable. How do leaders become leaders in our world today? Many a times the leadership that comes to the forefront in our world today are people not who have justice, not people who have equity, not people who are standing for truth, not people who have any of these moral traits. Rather, you find the people who are coming to the forefront in leadership in much of our modern world today are people, for example, who are well connected. They have family connections, for example. People who have been well connected in politics, people who have been well connected in government, people who have been well connected in, for example, the arenas of entertainment, people who have been well connected in different fields of life. So, for example, if you look at the example of a man like, for example, uh, the former president of the United States, uh, for example, you look at the history, you'll find in that you'll find certain people who have been actors, for example, historically, uh, those people coming to the forefront, you'll find in many other countries you'll find these examples now if someone's an actor or an athlete for that matter or any of these things that by in itself is not necessarily a bad thing and rather many times people who are athletes or actors or celebrities in some capacity if they are using their talents for good if they are using their influence for good then this is was something that should be welcome however if the sole reason for that person's influence is that, and that is the only end goal, and there is no interest in justice, there is no interest in peace, there is no interest in equity, and it's solely power for power's sake, the, may, the way we mentioned the Umayyads the night before, that the Umayyads, many of them were only interested in power for power's sake, whereas Ali ibn Abi Talib was interested in power to establish justice as a tool, not an ends, as a means, that was the view of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Therefore, if someone has political connections, if someone has family connections, if someone has a tremendous amount of wealth, if someone has a tremendous amount of fame, and this person comes to the forefront of leadership, which we see so often in our modern world, does that necessarily mean the person's a good person? Does that necessarily mean the person's qualified for the position? Is that, does, does that necessarily mean that the person is the right person fit for leadership? This goes back to what Plato or Aflatun said is the challenge and the problem of modern democracy or democracy as we know it today. Even Winston Churchill said democracy is the worst form of government, except everything else has been tried. That he acknowledged that it's a form of lesser of evils. The same thing Plato was saying, that this idea that sometimes you have people, not sometimes, many a times, most of the time, you have people who are unqualified to make a decision about leadership that is through the popular vote. But we don't have many better means, and therefore this becomes the lesser of the evil argument. Therefore, people say, oh, this person is famous, a celebrity. This person is known in sports. This person is wealthy. Therefore, if we see wealth, if we see celebrity status, if we see sportsmanship, we, if, we, if we see athleticism, if we see people famous on one front, we think that they achieved what they achieved necessarily by means of doing things right, for example. And we don't consider luck. I'll give you the example of wealth. There are many people in our world who have worked very hard and very ethically, as we will see later in the lecture and conversation, that who worked very hard and ethically to obtain wealth. But there were other people who did not work hard and they just inherited wealth, for example. Not necessarily that that's bad on its own merit, but there's nothing special in that. Or they inherited wealth. Or, for example, they swindled people, or they cheated people, or they treated people wrong and created mass amounts of wealth. Does that person necessarily become a great leader if they cheated and stole in order to become a leader? So these are all of the elements of the equation that you and I must look at when we're looking at leadership, when we're looking at how someone can become a great leader. 
With Isla within Islam, there is also a perspective of who should become the leader. Leader. In order to understand that perspective, we need to understand the philosophy of Ali ibn Abi Talib. We need to understand the perspective of Ali ibn Abi Talib. We need to understand the world view of Ali ibn Abi Talib. What happened after Ali ibn Abi Talib? You will see. You will see after Ali ibn Abi Talib, the situation of Saqifa emerged. Saqifa was a pavilion that was owned by Bani Saada. Saqifa Bani Saada is the whole name. So what happened was a group of people congregated in this pavilion where there was by Bani Saada that was owned by Bani Saada. It included the likes of Abu Bakr, it included the likes of Omar and many other companions from the Muhajirun and from the Ansar. And what is highlighted by Ayatollah Shamsuddin in his book and his works, he highlights that the when Saqifa Bani Sa'da emerged and this congregation happened and this meeting happened, while Rasulullah, the Holy Prophet, is on his deathbed, the Muslims all congregated there. When they congregated, their true nature, their true state, their true feelings, their true vision, their true view of the world all emerged. How? Their, their tribalism emerged once again. Rasulullah, the Holy Prophet, who came to eradicate tribalism, who came forward to try to eliminate tribalism. He said, there is no one better than another. An Arab is not better than a non-Arab. And a non-Arab is not better than an Arab, except in taqwa, except in piety. This holy prophet, this messenger of Allah, who tried to eradicate tribalism and say, the only one who's better than another is on the basis of God consciousness, on the basis of piety, on the basis of righteousness. This messenger, as soon as he has not even closed his final eyes, he has not gone and left this world. He's on his deathbed, still alive. And when he, he calls and he asks the people, give me a pen and a paper so I may write for you something, someone calls out and screams out that, that hasbuna kitab Allah. The book of Allah is enough for us. The book of Allah is sufficient for us. And they congregated at Saqifah Banu Sa'ada. What happened there? Ayatollah Shamsuddin says, his, the, the tribalism of the Arabs, of those people, emerged again. The Ansars, for example, and the Muhajirs, these people began to say, especially the Ansars amongst them, they cultivated a sense of tribalism. The likes of Abu Bakr and Umar, they began to say, your family is this, and my family is this, and my tribe is this, and your tribe is this. And they began to get a conversation around tribalism and not about Islam, not about taqwa, not about righteousness, not about who's most qualified, none of that. It was about tribes. The Aus and the Khazraj, these were two tribes. The Khazraj, the Khazrajites, so the Khazrajis were trying to stake claim as well. But the Aus pledged allegiance to Abu Bakr. When they did this, you saw that the, Khari, the, the Khazraj were not able to get their position. And I recall and I remind you that it was Omar who drew his sword in his anger and said, who does not pledge allegiance to Abu Bakr, off with their head essentially. This was the idea that there was trepidation of forcefulness and there was a lack of consensus. Consensus, And in haste, the Abu Bakr became the ruler. Why? By some system that was not grounded in Islamic principles. It was just what they chose based on their tribalism. This is the reality of the matter and the fact of the matter. As this moment, in, as time progressed, Abu Bakr went to power, then Omar went to power. And Omar's time, I said, the Muslim era, the Muslim region expanded, but not in the right way. The Muslim empire expanded through bloodshed, through looting, through plundering, and all the likes. And the status quo for the average Muslim became very good. Many people became Muslim just because it was advantageous economically to do so. And therefore, it expanded. And again, during the time of Uthman. When Uthman was killed, when Uthman was assassinated, the people came to the door of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. When the people came to the door of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, at that point in time, Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen, he reluctantly accepted. When he accepted this position, there came a time when he accepted, he said that he will now come to the time of his inaugural speech. When people come to the mantle of leadership in the United Kingdom, in the United States, in Canada, and throughout the world, across the world, it is the custom and the tradition that a leader, a president, a prime minister, a world leader, a statesman, when they come to the mantle in the position of leadership, they give an inaugural speech. They give an inaugural address. When they give an inaugural speech, they give an inaugural address. They highlight and they outline what is their philosophy of leadership? What is their philosophy of governance? What is their philosophy of how they will operate? What are the ethics that they will espouse to? What are the traits and goals that they will work towards? 
for example they will say for example we will try to develop the economy we will try to make sure everyone is taken care of economically we will try to bolster safety we will make sure that our borders are safe we will make sure that our country is safe and all of these different promises and things are highlighted some are attended to throughout the term some are not attended to throughout the term nonetheless Ali ibn Abi Talib also gave an inaugural address. He also gave an inaugural speech. But what did Ali ibn Abi Talib say when he came into the masjid? When Ali ibn Abi Talib came to the masjid to give his inaugural speech in Medina, there was a state, there was a moment where Ali ibn Abi Talib enters into the mosque. When he enters into the mosque to give his inaugural address, he enters in a state where he goes straight towards the member of Rasulullah. When he went straight towards the member of Rasulullah, we are told, that on the first stair, the first Khalifa would sit. On the second stair, the second Khalifa would sit. On the third stair, the third Khalifa would sit. All the way at the top was the position of where Rasulullah would sit. Amir al muminin he goes straight forward. He steps on the first sit stair. He steps on the second stair, on the third stair, up until the point that he gets up to the fourth stair and sits right where Rasulullah used to sit. And he praises Allah and he thanks Allah for haq, for truth being established back to where it is rightfully belonged. That is, he has come and he highlights in his speech what he means by this action, this symbolic action, where he sits with Rasulullah sat. And he begins to say and he begins to call out to the people and he says, he says, oh people, this state after the death and the martyrdom of Rasulullah, after the death and the martyrdom of the Holy Prophet, he says that Abu Bakr took on the mantle of leadership because he was elected by the people. Amir al-Mumini knows the truth and the reality. It was a forceful election, a coerced election. Nonetheless, he says he was elected by the people. And then the second one, Omar came to power because he was nominated and appointed by Abu Bakr directly. The first one, election. The second one, Ali ibn Abi Talib says, Abu Bakr appoints Omar. Then Ali ibn Abi Talib continues in his inaugural address. And he says, then Omar appointed a council, a shu'ara, which gave veto power to one individual by the name of Abdul Rahman ibn Auf. And that council elected Uthman. When Uthman was elected, he has now been assassinated. He has now been killed. You came to my door and you pledged allegiance to me and said that you will you accept only my leadership and the ummah and the nation needs me. And while I am not in need of this, and so I reluctantly accepted this position. Ali ibn Abi Talib then lays out his first principle. He says that I am not above you. And he says that in the principle of you have the right, you have the permission to question me that I am a human being like you. Ali ibn Abi Talib is laying a leadership principle that the leader is not to be seen in terms of ethics, in terms of morality, in terms of spirituality, in terms of philosophy, he's not supposed to be seen over the people as a tyrant, as an oppressor. Rather, the people have a right to ask the leader, for example. They have a right to question the leader if need be. But Ali ibn Abi Talib says, continuing, that don't unnecessarily question because know that any action that I take, any work that I do, know that there is a philosophy behind it. Know that I am following the sunnah and the seerah of the Holy Prophet when I undertake actions. Nonetheless, you have the ability to follow, you have the ability to ask. And he says that I have a goal and that goal is to take you back to the time and the place of the Holy Prophet Rasulullah. My goal is to take you back to the times of Rasul al-Azam, of the Holy Prophet, because it's been 25 years since Rasulullah has passed away at the time of the inaugural speech of Rasulullah. What does this statement of Amir al-Mu'mineen say? What does it tell you and I? It tells you and I that after Rasulullah's death, Islam had deviated away from the path of Rasulullah. If it had not deviated away from the path of Rasulullah, then how is Imam Ali alayhi salam saying that I am here to guide you back to the path of Rasulullah. I am here to establish the times and the principles and the ethics and the philosophy of Rasulullah. How is it that he's saying that? That means that during the time of the first Khalifa and the second Khalifa and the third Khalifa, Islam was not being followed in the way that Rasulullah had taught it. It was not being followed in the way that, Islam, that Allah wanted it to be. It was not being followed in the right way. Therefore, Ali ibn Abi Talib is highlighting that. The 
first action, the second action that highlights this is when Ali ibn Abi Talib, Imam ibn Mu'minin, he said that I will follow the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Quran, and I will follow the sunnah and the seerah of Rasulullah. And finally, I will, they will ask him to follow the sunnah of the first khulafa, the first and second khalifa. He said, no, I will not follow the sunnah of the first and the other khulafa before me, the ones who took that position, because it was very clear that I said I will follow the Quran and the Ahlul Bayt and the, and the sunnah of Rasulullah. If I will follow the Quran and sunnah of Bayt, of Rasulullah, does that mean that what Abu Bakr, Omar, Uthman did, was it different than these two? He's giving a thought-provoking question. That means that it was different. Otherwise, what's the need for it? He says the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet Sirah and Sunnah is sufficient for me. And I will judge based on that. This is what Ali ibn Abi Talib clearly stated for the people. Nonetheless, Amir al-Mumin continues his inaugural address and we'll cover a portion of this, inshallah, in future lectures, the other portions. Uh, in that moment when time, Ali ibn Abi Talib, he says, I have no interest, I have no need, I have no purpose of this khilafah. In fact, he highlights what Rasulullah said. He said, the Holy Prophet of Islam has stated that anyone who becomes a governor or ruler over the people will be questioned on Sarat will be questioned on the bridge, on the day of judgment, will be asked about their leadership. Meaning, Ali ibn Abi Talib saying, it's a burden for me. The other rulers were saying, we want power because it gives us honor, it gives us prestige, it gives us positions, it gives us societal integrity, and our family becomes prestigious. Ali ibn Abi Talib said, no. Rasulullah said, the person who leads, who governs, he will be questioned on the sirat, on the bridge, on the day of judgment. This is a burden on my neck. This is a burden upon me. This is a responsibility. But Ali ibn Abi Talib knew he was the only one who could administer justice. He's the only one who could administer peace. He's the only one who could help make the world a better place. And therefore he took on the mantle of leadership. Therefore he took on the mantle of Khilafat, although he was the Imam Bila Fasl, without any gap. This was the position of Ali ibn Abi Talib, Amir al muminin but I want to come to the next point. Ali ibn Abi Talib, in his inaugural address, in his inaugural speech, he highlights the first principle. <coughs> Excuse me. He highlights the first principle. He says, my first pledge to the people. Ya Ali, what is your first pledge, Ya Amir al-Mumini? He said, my first pledge to the people is that I will become a blockade. I will block. I will become an obstruction. For who? For those people who looted the Baytul Mal. Allah. Ali ibn Abi Talib says for those people who looted, for those people who plundered, for those people who stole money from the Baytul Mal, I will be their first blockade. I will be the first person blocking their vision and their path. Those people, Ali ibn Abi Talib's words, not mine, those people who used the public treasury, who used the public positions, those advisors, those ministers, those close ones to the other khalifa, those people who use the public treasury and the public funds in order to build wealth, in order to build property, in order to build estates, in order to get women, in order to get wells and streams flowing of water. Those people who use the public treasury in order to build wealth, I will become a blockade in their way. And I will make sure that if they obtain these wealths, by honest means, they will keep their wealth. But if they obtain these, this wealth, these streams of rivers, these, all of these properties that they own and possess, that they have in their possession, if they ob took them by nefarious means, if they took them by wrongful means, if they took them by the wrong means, I will make sure that all of that is given back to the Baytul Man and given back to the people. He said, first and foremost, I will administer justice. These people, who Amir al-Mumin says, they built their wealth, they built their estates, they got women, they got horses, the cars of the time. They built all of these streams and rivers and they focused on the luxuries of this world and neglected the hereafter. Ali ibn Abi Talib says, I will make sure that justice is administered and the people who have whose right has been taken from the public treasury, that right is returned back. 
And if they ex accept it, and if they got this with rightful means, and if they got this fairly, they can keep it, no problem. I say this because in Islam, there's a principle that Ali ibn Abi Talib is laying out here, that a leader should not use his office or her office in order to focus solely on themselves. A leader should not use their office in order to take over other people's rights at their own benefit and neglect the people. Rather, no, a leader should first focus on the people more than anything else. And finally, themselves. The people, the leader's job is to administer justice. I say this because Ali ibn Abi Talib highlighted those people specifically who created, who had large streams of water flowing. Why is this one significant? What was their philosophy? The philosophy of others, those people who are khulafa, those people who are advisors to khulafa, those people who are close confidants to the first three khulafa, who are becoming wealthier and wealthier and wealthier, they were just taking the public treasury people's money and building for themselves. What did Ali ibn Abi Talib do? Now look at the worldview difference. This was one worldview. Take people's property and establish for yourself. What was the view of Ali ibn Abi Talib? For 25 years, Ali ibn Abi Talib, what was he doing when his right was taken by the first, second, and third? What was he doing? If you look at the history, you will find it clear. Ali ibn Abi Talib was working on research and he was writing a tafsir of the Quran and Majid al Furqan al Hamid, number one. Number two, we think he was just sitting at home. No, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Imam Amir al Mu'minin, he would go and establish land, he would develop land, he would develop property, he would develop wealth. This is how Ali ibn Abi Talib, he developed a tremendous amount of wealth. But what did he do with his wealth? That's the question I want to highlight. We're told there's a moment in time in Islamic philosophy, in Islamic economic development. If you want to build a land, if you want to own a land or possess a land, you have the right to take on any land that has not been claimed by anyone else, with the exception that you develop the land. You cultivate the land. So for example, the Muslims were in Medina. If someone goes outside of Medina, they are allowed to say that this land is mine. This six by six plot of land is mine. I will develop it. The responsibility of developing it, working on this land is my responsibility. In turn, this property becomes mine. The orchards on this become mine. The water on this become mine. All of this becomes mine. But why? For my sweat equity, the labor that I put in, in order to build this land. Ali ibn Abi Talib, we're told he took on some land outside of the city of Medina. When Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen took on this land outside the city of the Medina, he would, for example, work very hard to cultivate land. We're told there's a moment in time where Imam Amir al muminin he walks towards the jungle, towards the forest outside of Medina, and he begins to, he has a sack on his back. When he has a sack on his back, the people ask, Ya Ali, where are you going? What are you taking with you? What do you have with you? He said, date palms, inshallah. Of course, he did not have date palms at that point in time, but they were just the seeds that Ali ibn Abi Talib was going to plant in the land outside of Medina. This was the vision of Amir al muminin When Imam Amir al muminin started to cultivate another piece of land outside of the city of Medina, he went towards this piece of, piece of land. When he went towards this piece of land, he took out his pickaxe and he took out his shovel and he began to dig. And he began to dig. He first found a place that he said, this is a suitable place in the center in a reasonable location within this plot of land. And the goal was to be able to strike water. When his goal was to be able to strike water, at that point in time, he did the dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and had trust and tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that my Lord will make my hard work fruitful. And he began to dig. He began to dig with a shovel in the middle of the ground. One day he's digging, digging, digging very much to the point that nothing emerges. Ali ibn Abi Talib goes home for the day. The next day he comes back again. He begins to dig again. Look at the hard work of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. This person who is Mazharul Ajaib, who is Fatah Khaybar, who's the person who has all of the strength and all of the knowledge, look at how he's working. There was no one more intelligent. There was no one, no one more wise than Ali ibn Abi Talib. Look at how he's acting. But he's working hard in the fields. A principle of leadership. Ali ibn Abi Talib is working. He's digging. Day two. Day three, he comes again. He digs. He digs. He digs. Nothing emerges. The next day, several days pass in this way. One day we're told Ali ibn Abi Talib comes to that plot of land that he's working on developing. And when he comes to this plot of land that he's working on developing, he begins to strike and he begins to strike. He takes a pickaxe this time, a pointed structure, and he begins to 
strike the, the land and he begins to strike the earth. Nothing is emerging. At that point in time, Ali ibn Abi Talib, his breath is becoming very strong. He's becoming, he's breathing very hard. He's sweating profusely to the point that the narration says that the people in the surrounding city began to come out and they began to see what's going on. At that point in time, Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen, he's look at him. He's not embarrassed. He's not humiliated. Rather, he's saying that my dignity, my honor is in this hard work. Those people, the other, look at the dichotomy. Look at the difference in viewpoint. Ali ibn Abi Talib's view is working hard and honest in front of people. Does not matter. That is, that is true Islam. The other ones steal the property, loot the property of the public treasury behind the scenes so that in public we look very nice and dignified because we have lots of wealth. Ali ibn Abi Talib is laying out his principle in his philosophy, his philosophy, his ethics, his way of seeing the world, in his actions, his ethical traits. When the people came out, Ali ibn Abi Talib stepped out. He removed the sweat from his eyebrow, the tradition says, and then he went back into the, 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 the hole that he had dug. He went back in one more time. This time he took all of his strength and he struck the ground. When he struck the ground, at that moment, the ground could no longer take it. A spring of water emerged and began to spring forward from the earth. At that point in time, all of the people witnessing this, all of the people seeing this, all of the people looking at this scene and this scenario, they began to exclaim. There were mixed emotions. Some people were happy. Some people were sad. Some people were jealous. Some people were mixed emotions. Some people said that Ali ibn Abi Talib has worked hard and he's a generous person and he's a kind person and he's a compassionate person. Therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has rewarded Ali ibn Abi Talib for his kindness, his generosity, and his hard work. Surely he will do good work with this income. Why? Because anyone who hit a spring in Arabia, remember it's the desert, water is not accessible easily. Anyone who creates a fountain of water, that person has access to tremendous wealth. Why? Because on that land, Ali ibn Abi Talib can now use that water as he wishes. He can build orchards, he can build date orchards, he can build different fruits, he can grow different fruits, he can grow different vegetables. All of this becomes an ability for him to grow crops in order to sell them and he will become tremendously wealthy. And the Ahlul Bayt after that became tremendously wealthy. Imam Hassan alayhi salam, Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Imam Amir al muminin dug this well. When he dug this well, the people came forward and said, one group said, Ali has done this and he, Allah has gifted him for his generosity. The other group came forward and became very jealous. Another group came forward and said that Ali ibn Abi Talib, him and his descendants are rich forever. They never have to work again. They never have to worry again. It was as if someone had struck oil. That's how important, that's how valuable a wellspring was at that time. But look at Ali ibn Abi Talib. As soon as this well and water springs out from the ground, and Ali ibn Abi Talib, the one who worked so hard and did all the work to get this water spring, what happened? He said, oh people, bring me a paper and pen. He said, oh people, bring me a paper and pen. They said they brought him a paper and pen. When they brought him a paper and pen, Ali ibn Abi Talib, he says, I am writing a trust to you. He said, a trust. Look at the philanthropy of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Look at the selflessness of Ali ibn Abi Talib. He's done all of the work and now he struck water, which was like striking oil or like striking gold. This entire property is now his. Look what he's doing. He says, bring me a paper and bring me a pen. He says, I have endowed this to you. I am entrusting this to you. I am wakfing this to you, this water spring that you may be able to benefit. For who? He puts conditions. He says, I want you to use the wealth from this for the poor, the people and the destitute, the people who do not have anyone to look after them, the poor of society, make sure you use the wealth from this water spring that you develop the land. When you develop the land and this water allows you to build orchards, this wealth will be used for the poor and the destitute. Who else, Ya Amir al-Mumineen? The second condition Ali ibn Abi Talib puts, any traveler who comes to town, any traveler who comes here, I want the money from the spring that I dug as an endowment, as a trust, as a waqf, I want that to be used on the traveler. This was number two. Number three, Ali ibn Abi Talib says, I want the wealth from this well that I have dug as an endowment, as a trust, as a waqf. I want you to do, use this wealth 
to help the orphans get married. Allahu Akbar. The vision of Ali ibn Abi Talib. He's highlighting a principle, not a principle, many principles for you and I, so we can understand what we should be doing with our wealth, what we should be doing in terms of philanthropy, what we should be doing in terms of making the world, the world a better place. Ali ibn Abi Talib says, first for the poor and the destitute, second for the traveler who is traveling here in this land, and then he says to make number three to make sure that those people who are or, who are orphans who don't have someone to take care of them, there you t- make sure that they get married when there's the time for them to get married. Why can you and I not do this as well? He says number four to make sure that those people who need medical aid, who need medical assistance, who need income in terms of medical medicine. Make sure that those people, if they don't have the money, use the money from this well, use the money from this endowment, use the money from this trust so that you help them be able to have medicine when they need medicine. And finally, he says, number five, I entrust and I endow this so that you use the excess income from this well for the public good, for making the world a better place. And whoever needs it for the public good, use this wealth from this well that Ali ibn Abi Talib has dug to make the world a better place. And he says at the final, at the end, he says, I have done this for the rada, for the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for the hereafter and from salvation from the hellfire. Ali ibn Abi Talib is much exalted and above the hellfire, but he's laying a principle out for you and I. When you and I work hard, when we get something, if I were to strike gold, if I were to strike wealth, if I were to strike oil, what would I do? I question for myself and for all the brothers and all of those watching and all of those across the globe. Would we follow in the way of Ali ibn Abi Talib or would we follow in the ways of the others? Remember, Imam Amir al-Mumineen, in his inaugural speech, he's saying, I am here to be a blockade for those people who took the public treasury and built their own wealth. And he highlighted those people who built flowing streams of water for themselves. Ali ibn Abi Talib built flowing streams of water and he did it on his own hard work. But for who? He did it for the people. He endowed it to the people. He walked it to the people. In Usul al-Kafi, our most authentic book of tradition, according to many scholars, in that Ali ibn Abi Talib used his wealth to free not one, not two, not 100. In Usul al-Kafi, we have a narration that Ali ibn Abi Talib used his wealth that he developed in that 25-year period to free over 1,000 slaves in the way of Allah. This is what Ali ibn Abi Talib did with his wealth. He was not focused on wearing the most luxurious things or things of this nature. Not necessarily. Not in his time and space. Yes, Imam Hassan alayhi salam used to wear good clothes and say, in Allah jameel, yuhabbu jamal, that Allah is beautiful and he loves beauty. But Ali ibn Abi Talib is laying a principle and he's stating a fact. And the fact that he's stating is clear. And that is that a leader should first impose the regulation that he will put on others on himself first and foremost of justice, equity, and, and, and egalitarianism. This is what Ali ibn Abi Talib espoused. This is the difference in the philosophy of the two worldviews. The worldview that emerged after the death of Rasulullah in the form of the first three Khulafa, in the form of the Umayyad rulers, in the form of the Abbasid rulers. This was a face of Islam that was not true Islam. This was a face of Islam that was an adulterated Islam, a face of Islam that was a vulgar Islam, Islam that was not the Islam of Rasulullah. This is why Rasulullah's deputy, Ali ibn Abi Talib, in his inaugural speech, he states that I have come to return us back to the Islam of Rasulullah. That means that the Islam in the first three Khulafa's era had deviated away from true Islam. This is not to cause any friction between the Muslim world. Rather, it's to establish the truth and establish to understand the perspective of Ahlul Tashayyur that was understood by some and unfortunately is not understood today. The scholarship understood in the past that there was a very good reason why Shias believe what they believe. Unfortunately, there's become a narrative amongst some Muslims today, that's a minority view that's become majority, that the Shia are a political movement solely that has no religious basis. Rather, we believe in the philosophy of Ali ibn Abi Talib, 
the ethics of Ali ibn Abi Talib, the spirituality of Ali ibn Abi Talib, so that we can get those traits in our own lives. And in order to study the life of Ali ibn Abi Talib, we understand what true Islamic philosophy is, what true Islamic ethics are, and what true Islamic spirituality is, because they are not separated in true Islam. A ruler must impose upon themselves to be a good governor, to be a good ruler, to be a good leader, must first impose those on themselves in order to have Islamic philosophy, Islamic ethics, and Islamic spirituality. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us, to endow us with a fraction of the spirituality, a fraction of the ethics, a fraction of the philosophy of Ali ibn Abi Talib, and allow us to establish this in our lives. That we allow, we hope and we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to establish the justice of Ali ibn Abi Talib on earth. The one that the United Nations Arab Development, Human Development Report of 2002 highlighted. That Ali was that person who focused on knowledge. Ali was that person who told his ambassador Malik, he said that focus on developing the land and not focus first primarily on taxation. Because if you don't develop the land, then how will you tax the people? This justice, this fairness, this concern for the common individual, this egalitarianism, this looking after those people whose rights are downtrodden and not focusing solely on the elite as the Umayyads were doing, as the others. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to understand the principle of Ali ibn Abi Talib, to understand the principles of Rasulullah and allow us to implement it in our world, in our society. So our world, our globe is more just and equitable. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to hasten the reappearance of the Imam of our time, the rest of Zaman, so that our world is more peaceful. And once again, we know justice and we see justice on earth established through his hand so that all are living in peace and all are living in harmony. Wa akhru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin.